the best way to survive in the international system is to be much more powerful than all your neighbors militarily. But it is essential to understand that military power is largely a function of economic might. And the health of your economy is of enormous importance. <laughs> The complex challenge of how you spend your defense budget is related to your size of your economy. So first, I want a strong economy, so I have a bigger pot of money on which to spend on my Navy and my Air Force, but also on my space assets and my cyber assets and my special operations forces. The reason that we worry so much about China today is it has lots of people and it's getting very wealthy. If China was not getting wealthy, we wouldn't worry about China. So economic might is the foundation of military might. Therefore, when you think about the competition between the United States and China, resources and economic considerations matter greatly because they are the building blocks of military power. The U.S. is not a declining in absolute terms. The United States is continuing to grow, its population is continuing to grow, its GDP is continuing to grow. But relative to China's economy, we are declining. So when I say decline here, I mean strictly in relative terms. But that's very important because military capabilities and to some extent political influence is relative, not absolute. So no, the United States is not becoming less capable. In many, many ways, we're becoming more capable. But we're facing a country that's rising even more quickly. When you look across this very wide field of Chinese uh, military developments, I think many are drawn to the conclusion that China is a, a massive threat. One might even say a threat that uh, even exceeds that posed by the Soviet Union. After all, the Soviet economy was never even close to approximating the size of the U.S. economy. And yet, the most recent news is that the Chinese economy well, may well have pulled even with the U.S. economy, and projections are that it will significantly outpace the U.S. economy in the coming decades. Even if China's rate of economic growth slows considerably, many experts believe that the size of China's economy may surpass that of the United States within the next 10 years. So we're talking about a potential reversal of the Reagan years advantage we had over the Soviet Union which is that essentially in an arms race with the Soviet Union, our larger economy gave us the ability to sustain that arms race longer than the Soviets could manage. The Chinese have studied what happened in the Soviet Union. The Chinese position is that the Soviets knew how to make terrific weapons, but they couldn't make a loaf of bread. And it required them to have a strong economy to support their military technology and their military expansion. And what caused the Soviet Union to collapse was their very weak economy. And they are using that same scenario against us and trying to destroy our manufacturing base, trying to prohibit us from or minimizing our ability to innovate our products and weaken our economy so that our military becomes uh, second class and they can dominate the, the world. The Chinese defense expenditures and its uh, massive defense industrial apparatus will indeed yield a military that is, in, to my reckoning, will be a decade hence. I think we can say that it will um, be very close to the United States and capabilities. The United States uh, has not faced a serious strategic competitor uh, that had an economy larger than its own since the 19th century. Uh, so the U.S. has had the largest economy in the world since probably around 1880. Uh, we know in retrospect that the Soviet economy never came close to matching the size of the U.S. economy. Certainly the German and Japanese economies at the outbreak of the Second World War were only a fraction the size of the United States. Uh, the possibility that we might face a long-term competition with a country that has an economy uh, as big or perhaps bigger than ours is something new. 
China is not the Soviet Union. China has a much healthier economy than the Soviet Union did when we essentially outcompeted them under Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. China it may slow down to a 7 or 6 percent growth rate. It's still about the fastest growing economy in the world. And it's clearly the number one world manufacturing economy. And that trend is not slowing in the slightest. So the idea that we could somehow just ramp up our efforts and beat the Chinese at producing warships and fighter jets, I think is at best a short-term partial fix, cannot be an adequate long-term solution. If we face 1,000 Chinese anti-ship missiles, there's no way to stop them all. We can't afford it. If we faced 400 Chinese submarines instead of 60, by the way, the Soviets built 400 submarines, we cannot deal with that the size of our economy. The world we're moving toward is a world in which the Chinese economy has surpassed us and is growing toward being twice as powerful as us. That means if they want to, their defense spending can be focused on us and it can exceed our defense spending. That's the strategic picture. The process of economic development, in addition to these overall increases in the size of GNP and GNP per capita, is also making China a much more technologically sophisticated country. Uh, its ability to uh, develop and build advanced commercial systems and advanced military systems is growing. A lot of our technology is being transferred to the Chinese, what, what we call forced technology transfer. If Boeing wants to sell airplanes over in China, then the Chinese government will require them to turn over their technology. GE wants to sell jet engines, then the Chinese require GE to turn over their technology. And in that respect, China is a very different kind of military competitor, for example, than the Soviet Union was. The Soviet Union, for ideological reasons, cut itself off from the international trading system, cut itself off to a considerable degree from the global technological system, and tried to do everything on its own. Uh, and for a while it was able to keep up, and then it fell further and further behind. China is pursuing the inverse strategy. They are plugging themselves into the world economy and into the world technological and scientific systems as deeply as they possibly can. And that's a far smarter strategy, and it's enabling them to move forward much more rapidly. In this era of globalization, um, the constant challenge is upgrading our technological skills so that we can move into new, more ambitious, more innovative areas. Uh, in order to do that, we, we first have to have um, a scientific base that allows innovation to continue. Our particular strength militarily has always been is that we have better technology and better weapons than the other guys. But the Chinese are squeezing that technology out of us so that they can have the ability to make those high-tech weapons. For uh, China to steal the fruits of our innovation through intellectual property theft and cyber theft and other things um, has to be a, a serious uh, item on our diplomatic agenda. I do think that there are adjustments that we may need to make in the economic part of our relationship. Uh, one instance where I think we have to be rather careful is about uh, Chinese investment, foreign direct investment in the United States. Uh, as China has accumulated vast reserves of dollar-denominated assets, uh, they have uh, the resources now to invest throughout the world, they're doing that. Uh, including in the United States. And there are some areas in which that's completely uh, harmless and to be welcomed, uh, but there are areas where it should be a cause of serious concern, and in particular in certain technologies where gaining access to American companies, becoming partners or buying up American companies might allow China access to our telecommunication systems, might allow them access to leading edge technologies that could then be incorporated not only into commercial products but into military systems. So we're allowing the Chinese Communist Party to get an increasing toehold in the United States economy. We traditionally have not wanted our own government owning major chunks of our economy. And now we're on a road where we're going to let the Chinese government, controlled by the Communist Party, win large chunks of our economy. I think it's a very bad road for the United States to be on. You cannot have a superior military force without superior technology. 
And when you start to cut back on your research, when you have uh, companies that uh, like Boeing and General Electric and other companies who are transferring technology to the Chinese, you put yourself at an enormous disadvantage because what makes us such a strong, powerful global power is our technology and our innovation, our weapon systems that are far superior to any other country in the world today. These multinational corporations who are transferring jobs, industrial strength, technology, are not only weakening our economy, they're weakening our national security. We have a weak economy because we have allowed ourselves to get into a trade deficit with China. We have um, uh, shut down over 70,000 factories in the United States. We are consuming more than we are producing. And we have gotten ourselves into a situation where our trade deficit over the last 10 years has gone to over $3 trillion, with most of that going to the Chinese. And until we can get control of our trade deficit and start producing our own products, uh, we're going to have enormous economic problems in this country. Here's what's going on, and it's very important to understand this. When you are running massive trade deficits with a country like China, which we are, last year $315 billion, it means that jobs that used to be here producing for the American and American employers and, and American workers are now in China. And we're importing stuff that we used to be able to make. The jobs are not here, the jobs are in China. The wealth being created by that, those jobs is being taxed by the Chinese for their wealth. And what used to contribute to the American economy, the taxes on that production, is now not here and feeds our budget deficits. Everybody's concerned about budget deficits. The trade deficit feeds your budget deficit, and so much of it is with China that we're weakening ourselves. I think there is a consensus that government policies in China have tilted the playing field in ways that are favorable to Chinese entities and unfavorable to foreign entities, uh, whether it's the uh, manipulation of currency, uh, subsidies for exports, local content uh, regulations, indigenous in, uh, innovation requirements. Uh, the Chinese are stretching uh, the rules of the international trading system w into which they have been allowed in ways that benefit them at the dis to the disadvantage of other countries. Uh, and we've, for the most part, accepted that, I think, because it appeared that the costs of opposing it were too high, and also because I think there was a hope that in the long run they would sort of come along and this really wouldn't make that much of a difference. Uh, I think that also needs to be re-examined. Essentially what the American consumer has to understand is, one, their jobs are going to Asia. Wouldn't it be better to have a job than a cheaper good from China? The second thing they have to understand is their dollars going to Asia are strengthening China's military capabilities. I think that at every level, people could boycott to some extent, and there would be a shot heard around the world. It's got to be a whole community effort by the citizenry, but we do need to create jobs. It doesn't always happen accidentally. Here's the message that needs to be developed. You know, look, it doesn't have to be this way. This is an economy and a global economy that has been made by policy choices policy choices that really do uh, benefit the, the rich and the multinationals. Their interests no longer coincide with the interests of this country. So we have to do what's best for this country. They'll do what's best for their company, but we have to do what's best for this country. And that means all of us coming together, building an economy that really does work for everybody.
In fact, American consumers and citizens seem to be far ahead of our politicians when it comes to understanding both the dangers we face and the need for fundamental change. We're a subsidiary of China and getting worse and worse because they're going to own us pretty soon. No, you can't have it both ways. We either want the jobs, the manufacturing, everything here in the United States, and we're going to buy it, but you go to the store and you look for the cheapest thing, which usually comes from China. I do buy China stuff, but I would prefer to buy American things. Why? Uh, I think it's better just to support the economy here rather than, you know, you can buy cheaply in China, but I think it's better for our economy if we buy here. We also got to look at our principles, too. Look how they're living. Is that what we want to support? We open up our markets to everybody. And uh, I, I think that if that's how it's going to be, it needs to be a two-way street. And I think, I think politically, our system has not supported you know, the, the American worker, the American product from that standpoint. My great hope is that China's economy will slow down on its own. I think it's in America's interest, uh, and it's in the interest of China's neighbors to see the Chinese economy uh, slow down in terms of its gro growth rate in, in really significant ways in, in the future, because if that happens, it then can't become a formidable military power. My view would be that the comprehensive national power of the United States, the quality of our human resources, the quality of our infrastructure, the quality of our K through 12 education, the quality of our research and development, these are the bases of power. And quite frankly, the Chinese respect those. When we are healthy along those dimensions, the Chinese, I think, stand up and pay attention. If we're declining in terms of our comprehensive national power and our national capabilities in these ways, I think basically the Chinese are going to be more difficult to deal with. What's the purpose of our economy? What's the purpose of our military? It is to basically build a world that we want our children to grow up in. We want it to be free. We want there to be economic opportunity. That's a liberal world order in the parlance of international relations. Well, we've had a liberal world order since World War II because the United States built it. We built it on the lives of a lot of brave Americans who fought and died in wars and some who lived. Um, and we've preserved it ever since by playing a leadership role in the United Nations, trying to establish against all common sense, really, of human sort of interests, international rules. Um, and a lot of them have worked. A lot of them have helped provide order to what has been called an anarchical society, a world where, again, nobody enforces the rules and it's every man for himself. We don't want to live in a world where it's Lord of the Flies. We want to live in a world where there's predictable, peaceful, prosperous opportunity, and we're not going to get there if we don't lead, if we don't play that active role. What the United States needs to be concerned about is the balance of power in the region. And Admiral Locklear, our current commander of U.S. Pacific Command, testified before Congress that the balance of power in the Pacific is shifting away from us and towards China. He openly admitted it, and, and others admitted as well. So the question is, how do you get involved in order to maintain a stable balance of power? There are a number of steps which I think we need to take. One is we have to strengthen the alliance relationships that we have throughout the region. The United States has maintained peace and stability since the end of World War II because of our network of alliances. Today, in a vast arc from Japan in the Northeast to Southeast Asia in the Southeast to India in uh, South Asia in the Southwest of China, uh, there is a disequilibrium. Each of these entities is beginning to wonder what China's rise means for their own national security. And China, as you well know, has a series of grievances uh, with many of these countries that go back uh, to colonial times. Uh, it is the resolution of these grievances, hopefully by diplomacy, but possibly by military force, that really begins to uh, dominate uh, the character of geopolitics in Asia and will for some time to come. I think when you look back over the centuries of Chinese centrality in Asia, they thought and rightly so, they were the ones who made the rules. They, they didn't have to talk to other peoples. Other peoples had to talk to them. That, I think, is really a very long-term historical Chinese attitude. And the issue that friends in Asia and the United States has to face is that as China becomes more powerful, they seem more eager and willing to adopt that position than an accommodating position. 
we have a great advantage, and that is that there are potential strategic partners in that part of the world who are at least as worried, and in some cases more worried, about the implications for their own security of China's growing strength as we are. Uh, and we need to work closely with them to encourage them to exert more effort themselves, to devote more resources themselves to building up their own strength as part of an overall uh, effort to maintain a balance of power uh, with China. The most important thing is to make sure that the United States is forward engaged with a variety of strong, growing economies and militaries in Asia Pacific. We cannot be focused solely on China. The most important thing is that we pay less attention to the Chinese and more attention to our allies and friends. The region today, including us, is sort of myopic on the China question. But there is this other piece of the puzzle that economic is absolutely economically. We need to be a good, solid partner with Japan and the dynam dynamic economies of Southeast Asia. Japan uh, has been at the heart of that calculation for us, and I think it's, it's important that that continue to be the case. But there are other countries, too, in the region, like Australia, to a lesser extent the Philippines, South Korea, too, India, uh, which is not a treaty ally of the United States, but shares with us a strategic concern about the growth of Chinese power. We need to take advantage of the kind of natural tendencies towards maintaining a balance of power that exists in the international system and historically have, already, have always been there. We can't count on them to work automatically. In fact, if it appears that we're opting out uh, or we don't think that we can maintain that balance, we can't count on other people to do it for us because I don't think they believe they can do it without us. I think we need, uh, frankly, a little more help from our friends in the region uh, who are often very happy to have us come in, um, cooperate with them, have the U.S. Navy just over the horizon to have security agreements with us. But then when they meet the Chinese or when they're in multilateral forums, pretend everything's fine. <laughs> I mean, these are small countries, um, especially in Southeast Asia. And they want the U.S. there, and they want to cooperate more because they're nervous about China. But China's big, and China sometimes is um, vindictive, and China will sometimes punish small countries. Um, so part of the way, frankly, we convince China that this is not containment is to have the countries in the region that are asking us to help them manage Chinese pressure, have them say to the Chinese, look, you're scaring us. We want to trade with you. We wish you success. We want an." In inclusive regional order where China's a big, big player and a partner, but you're scaring us. There are places to do that. The ASEAN Regional Forum, where foreign ministers from across the region meet. The East Asia Summit, where leaders from across the region meet. I think one game for the U.S. diplomatically is to, to give some of these countries a little bit more um, conviction and courage in these forums to say, we want some basic code of conduct that when we have regional disputes over territory, no force, no boycotts, no intimidation. One of the features that's so important about the possibility of decreasing naval operations worldwide is the reaction of our allies. We have mutual defense treaties with Korea, Japan, the Philippines, and Australia. We have a near equivalent with uh, Thailand. We have special military relationships with Singapore and Taiwan. All of these indicate to us requirements for maintaining military presence in these regions. A lot of the Asian nations that are threatened by Chinese territorial claims, fishing rights, sovereignty, and so on, are trying to build up amphibious capability. They're trying to build up their surface ship fleet um, so that they can defend their particular fishing interests or mineral interests or territorial interests. That's all a good thing. Uh, but uh, for the United States to expect that those countries, either solely or in the aggregate, can equal China, which has the second largest defense budget in the world, is unrealistic um, and inconsistent with the history of successful alliances. The Chinese strategy uh, in Asia right now is to try to split the alliance, and they appear to be using the three warfares, the media warfare, legal warfare, and psychological warfare. China wishes to cause the United States to look like an uncertain trumpet. It's not clear that we're really going to be there in the way that they'd like to see us uh, going forward. Uh, these countries are advised, be careful. 
the Americans are fickle. They may or may not do what they say they'll do. That's the message coming from Beijing. The Chinese view of our alliances is that these were okay during the Cold War when they were against the Soviet Union. But now they are what they call unnatural, or they use the term relic. And they don't, the Chinese don't, would never want to say, we want to push you out of Asia. This would only help the China threat theory. They want to say, as your friend, we advise you. These military alliances are obsolete. They're expensive. They're relics of the Cold War. You really don't need them. I don't know what's in the Chinese mind, but I think that if you look out to the projections that I've seen for 2050, the world of 2050 will have an America of 400 million and an alliance system with another 600 to 900 billion with us. So let's say it's a billion total, America plus Western Europe plus Japan, Korea, Australia. That alliance system is going to be two-thirds as populous as China. It's going to have control of a lot more land area. It's going to have a GDP per capita that's still three times China's, even at that point, by the best estimates we can see today. It's going to have a greater claim, uh, in all likelihood, on neutral countries like in Latin America or India, because we are brought together by a democratic spirit that allows countries to dissent from any specific foreign policy decision made by Washington or anyone else. And if we stay cohesive in this community, there's no reason why we should ever be in decline collectively against China. From the perspective of our allies and partners, there is so much more that they want and, and they ask from us. And, and the president, for example, has now for four years talked about a rebalance. They've heard that song, and, and it's great. In the beginning, they were happy to hear it. They wanted a president to talk about how important Asia was. But after four years, they're waiting for action to back it up. And what they don't see is the U.S. really being willing to commit to the specific concerns that they have. They understand that we're going to put some more ships and more planes in the theater. They understand that unless forced by budgets, we won't with, you know, draw down our forces. Uh, but what they don't see is that the U.S. Is, is really understanding the types of immediate pressures that they face. We need to have a policy that stands by our allies. And so I would stop making commitments that we then walk away from. I think it was Lincoln who said, better to keep your mouth shut and have people think you're a fool than to open your mouth and prove it for them. So right there, if we're going to make a commitment, then we need to stand by it. If we're not prepared to fulfill that, then keep our mouths shut. Well, now we've got treaty alliances, and, and the assumption is we would back up our treaty partners if, if they asked for our, our help and their territory was under attack. But there's a whole huge water space, I guess you could call it, between just everyday diplomatic life that happens in the region and war. And what our friends are worried about is that in that big middle space, we don't really seem to have a, a clear strategy. We think being there simply is enough. But they're saying you have to be here and you have to be involved. We've got territorial disputes. We have a, a rampantly building Chinese military. We have concerns over all sorts of, of issues that you don't have to worry about because you're not in the neighborhood. You know, everything from illegal fishermen to pollution. But you don't get involved in those. And so your presence here then is, again, a little bit of a, of a hollow facade. It's not that they they don't think we would come to their aid and extremists in the case of war. It's that they understand that most of their lives are dealing not with war, but of all those in-between actions. And so whether it's the fact that, that our political will prevents us from helping our, our Japanese friends in the Senkaku Islands dispute, or a much broader sense that the, the idea of the pivot or the rebalance is really just rhetoric, but we're not willing to, to put our, our money on the line when it comes to the issues that they're dealing with, our credibility gets undermined. And once the credibility gets undermined, all of our friends in the region have to think about their own interests. And they have to think, who should I be talking to? What should I be thinking about that's going to protect me the most? And before you know it, I think you could see our influence, which has been very, very steady, really start to drop off. Because they will suddenly say, I have to look out for myself, and I am not sure that the Americans, even with 300,000 troops in the Pacific, have the political will 
to uphold the very order that they helped create. The strategy should be that China should know that if it's not just going to hit one or two countries or targets or us, but it's going to involve a lot of countries uh, if, it, if it chooses to engage in war. Now, one way to begin to knit together some kind of uh, uh, more cohesive alliance structure would be to make sure that all the allies and partners can see and hear and survey the same Chinese activities uh, that we can. And uh, you do that by building what's called a coalition ISR uh, infrastructure, a intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance infrastructure, so that a Filipino officer can be looking at a computer screen and seeing the same thing as a U.S. officer is, is looking at in Hawaii or a Japanese officer is looking at in Okinawa. And first of all, that kind of gets to the bottom of the story. The Chinese are doing this here, they're doing that there. Uh, and then it begins to uh, suggest a path forward. Well, who's going to deal with this problem and who's going to deal with that problem? And it quickly divides up uh, the solution. So, so it has both an operational, uh, it has an operational function and it has a strategic function. The Chinese should know that uh, what they're doing is they're, they're creating a coalition that is balancing against their power and they have to take a lot of countries on if they choose to engage uh, in war. I think that we do need to be carefully assessing what our allies need and of course what they can afford and what they would want. There's lots of things you can do. There's greater intelligence sharing. There's there's greater training. There's giving them uh, there's giving them the the types of weapons that they need. So, for example, it, I never understood why we weren't willing to sell F-22s to Japan. Now, there's a country that does have the technological capability to handle this advanced fighter aircraft, and it's not really clear what the strategic rationale was behind denying that to them. None of that we've done, and you'll notice, by the way, we've done none of that with Ukraine either, only non-lethal aid to Ukraine. So we have a pattern of showing the limits of our engagement. And even though there's this huge water space between everyday diplomatic life and war, we've chosen not to get involved more that we could, which would, number one, help our friends, and number two, send a message to China. The aspect of American policy that, in the end, gives our friends and partners um, confidence um, that we are committed to their defense and to com committed to peace and stability uh, in East Asia is our willingness to spend a lot of money to deploy uh, these forces on um, a daily basis. Uh, and the fact that um, aircraft carriers and nuclear submarines are on patrol all the time uh, becomes very important. And it gives them less reason to develop their own military might in ways that, that might be destabilizing. Uh, it gives them um, more reason to focus their efforts on their economy and their society and their political systems. Uh, and that's been the secret of U.S. policy success for um, five or six decades. The whole point is not to prepare for war, but to prevent conflict. And I think historically it's proven to be the case that the best way of doing that is by maintaining a position of strength. We can't do that unless we have those alliance relationships and access to those bases and facilities. So there's a tricky balance here, which is if we have established alliances, which China does not especially like, and then as we expand our alliances um, to the Philippines and Vietnam, um, China is arguing, and I think with some justification that it looks like we're balancing against China and trying to encircle it. Um, and so there's a, this is a complicated balance, on, or complicated set of trade-offs. On the one hand, by supporting these alliances, we en enhance our ability to defend interests in the region. On the flip side, we may look threatening to China. And this it gets into one of the many dimensions of the security dilemma, which is if you look threatening to an adversary, they may become harder to deter at the same time, your alliances can improve your ability to deter, and we have to ask, is it enhancing our overall capability? My inclination on this particular aspect of the security dilemma is that tightening those alliances is good policy. Politically, we have to be effectively engaged in the region, and that means we have to understand that 
Asia is not just about China or Japan. It's about many countries. We're going to have to learn our languages. We're going to have to travel more and have more educational exchanges. We're going to have to make sure we have first-rate diplomats and development specialists who can engage in this region. The United States must be, and we are, a Pacific power. I mean, the, the future of our relationships in the region is, is, is a diplomatic question, right? But the reality is our economic vitality will fundamentally be based on the future of the Asia-Pacific.